W.E.D. Du Bois uh, lecture, uh, which is an annual event at Colgate, uh, and which has hosted some extremely <coughs> distinguished uh, speakers in the class. The scholarly world. There is a lot of discussion at the moment uh, about the idea of global history and global social science, about how we talk about the processes of globalization and how we introduce the category of the global. Um, and this is something which I think is much easier to talk about than actually to do. It's extremely difficult to study the world across boundaries. It requires you to know a lot about different places. And so, when a couple of years ago, I read uh, a book uh, entitled The Americans Are Coming, Dreams of African-American Liberation and Segregation in South Africa by Robert Trent Vincent. Um, I was tremendously impressed by the fact that this is a book which really does walk the walk rather than talk the talk of studying the global. Uh, it's a book which addresses one of the most remarkable social movements in modern world history, um, the movement led by Marcus Garvey, uh, of whom you will soon learn more. Uh, and it's a movement which Professor Worth just pointed out to me uh, was started exactly 100 years uh, ago. And what uh, uh, Robert Vincent does in this book is to show uh, the way in which a movement started by a West Indian working in the United States had an enormous impact in South Africa. Uh, so it's a truly global history. When I was asked therefore to suggest somebody for the uh, lecture, I immediately thought of Professor Vincent. And it's really a great pleasure to have him here uh, this evening. Um, let me say a little bit about him. Uh, Robert Vinson uh, has a PhD from Howard University. Um, is the book of which I've been talking, uh, The uh, uh, Americans Are Coming, came out just a couple of years ago. And if you're so inclined, you can uh, buy it on your way out. There's a, a table full of, of, of copies. Um, he is currently working on a biography of the great South African political leader who preceded Nelson Mandela as the head of the ANC, uh, Albert Bukumi. Um, and he's working on not one but two other books as well. Um, uh, Shark is Progeny, Zulu Culture, The Making of the Modern Atlantic World, with Benedict Carton, and uh, a documentary history, uh, Crossing the Water, African Americans in South Africa, edited uh, with Robert Edgar and David Anthony. Um, and uh, I think uh, this, is, this is really a lecture to uh, look forward to, and we're very pleased that you've consented to do it. Um, let me just do a couple of other things before uh, I hand over to Professor Vincent. Um, the uh, event is organized under the auspices of LST, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Brian Moore for his uh, initiative and leadership in putting this uh, together. Um, I'd like to thank the Dean, Doug Hicks, uh, for his support. I'd like to thank the History Department uh, for their sponsorship. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the way we're going to do this is uh, Rob Vincent is going to speak for uh, about 50 minutes, yeah? and then we'll have about 25, 30 minutes uh, questions. Uh, if you have to leave, I'd appreciate it if you left at the end of the lecture as quickly as, as, as possible. Um, otherwise, uh, please stay, and we should finish by around uh, six, uh, six o'clock. 
So, uh, it's my very great pleasure to present to you Professor Robert Trent Vinson, uh, who was Francis L. Edwin L. Cummings Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies at the College of William and Mary to give this year's Shirley Graham and Shafi to the boys. Thank you, Professor Heslop, uh, Professor Moore. Thank you, for Dean Hicks, uh, AL, ALST, still got it, got it now, and Department of History for inviting me, and the whole Colgate family. Thanks for coming out on a rainy day. I promise I didn't bring the rain. I'm not responsible for it. Uh, but we're here now. Thank you for coming. I know you don't have to be here and that you have many other things to do. I was uh, flying up last night uh, with a student who might be here, maybe, Sophie Kaufman. And she was telling me about your motto, work hard, play hard. And I know you all are working hard, and I'm sure you'll play hard later. Uh, so is Sophie here, by chance? She was a wonderful ambassador for Colgate. Does anybody know Sophie? Say hello to her, if anyone knows her. OK, <laughs> all right. So the talk today, and this really can be a type of conversation. I don't mind if you have questions while I'm lecturing. If you want to save it for after uh, the lecture, we can have a nice, engaging Q&A. But really, it's really on you how you make this a conversation or a lecture in a more formal kind of way. Can everyone hear me OK? Am I too loud? Perfect, OK. So our talk today is Which Way to Freedom? African Dreams of American Negro Liberation and Segregation in South Africa. And that term, American Negro, refers to African Americans and black West Indians. So as you see in this story, Africans in South Africa regarded black peoples from across the Atlantic generically as American Negroes. So that's the explanation for that, for that terminology. And where are we going with this talk? What are our themes? So our big, broad themes are, uh, one, Despite American Jim Crow in the 1890s and going forward, where African Americans were politically disenfranchised, economically marginalized, subjected to forms of racial terrorism like lynching, despite uh, what one scholar called the nadir of African American life in the 1890s, precisely at that moment, black South Africans 8,000 miles away were looking at African Americans with a very different lens. They were looking at African Americans as role models and they were fixated on African-American achievements despite, despite the disabilities of Jim Crow segregation. And this view of African-Americans creates a transnational relationship that will include politics, education, and religion, and will ultimately result in rather extraordinary prophecies of imminent liberation. Black South Africans are dealing, looking at American Jim Crow were also looking at themselves at that moment in the 1890s of encroaching colonialism and forms of racial discrimination known as segregation and then eventually in the 1940s, apartheid. So these two black populations 8,000 miles away along with black West Indians also dealing with forms of colonialism are going to link up and engage the Du Boisian term of a global color line understanding that localized forms of racial oppression are not isolated, are not separate, but in fact are joined together. And that's going to be an animating dynamic of people working together, people who have different regional, geographic, linguistic, cultural differences, will find certain unifying ideals to organize. And so that's the first dynamic. Uh, despite American Jim Crow, black South Africans viewed African Americans as role models for their own advancement. And African Americans used what I call an up from slavery narrative, a very optimistic, progressive narrative of their history coming out of 244 years of slavery, and despite dealing with Jim Crow, emphasizing their achievements and their future attainments, their future aspirations and hopes. This relationship, this transnational relationship, is not simply political, but it's also deeply religious. And so with transnational history, one thing to figure out is not simply to evoke connections, but to understand why there's a connection. What are the unifying dynamics that allow peoples who are very different to find common ground, common cause? And quite often when we do this kind of history, we tend to look strictly at politics in a very narrow sense. And one of the things that we'll talk about here is to look at the concept of religion and break down the boundaries of religion and politics. Right? So our second, our third ideal then, 
is the idea of Marcus Garvey. So this relationship between black South Africans, black West Indians, and African Americans uh, begins in the 1890s and continues into the 1920s. And then it takes another leap with the introduction of the Jamaican Marcus Garvey and his movement. And then our fourth uh, big point is that um, this transnational relationship beginning in the 1890s continues throughout uh, the 1990s into the present day today. So it's a long history, covers more of a century, and so that's where we're going. Are we ready? Shall we go? Yes? Okay. Yes. All right. So if we were to look at a map in the 1890s, when we begin our story, this is what's beginning to happen. There are certain historical processes that are happening. Right? There is colonialism, European colonialism in the West Indies, and increasingly in the 1890s into the first decade of the 20th century, there is European colonialism in Africa. And this is the colonial map that develops in the early uh, 20th century. Including in this, these forms of colonialism is at the bottom uh, of our screen there, South Africa, what becomes South Africa. And of course, I've already described to you American Jim Crow in a very broad sense, right? The point that I want to give you here is that W.B. Du Bois um, in 1900 is suggesting that there is a color line that belts the world, right? That, and indeed, that this is a global color line. And recently, scholars have sort of picked up on Du Bois' global implications. Initially, we thought <laughs> that he was talking about a color line in a domestic sense. But reading Du Bois a bit more carefully, he was talking about a global color line. So looking at the map like this, he, based in, in America, he was looking outward and connecting this global color line. Now, in the 1890s, in October 1890, our story begins here. So singing troupe called the Virginia Jubilee Singers. These are formerly enslaved African Americans, all graduates of an institute called Hampton Institute, now Hampton University. Right? And they are singers. They're extraordinarily beautiful singers. They sing what were called American Negro spirituals. These spirituals came out of the period of enslavement, where enslaved people sang about their despair, their disillusionment, but also their hope. And these spirituals had a deeply religious bent to them. So for instance, Go Down Moses was a spiritual that talked about African Americans being modern day Israelites. So we know the story of Exodus, right? I'm gonna get a little biblical on you. So what's the story of Exodus? So you decide how much you wanna participate here. <laughs> if you just want me to talk and talk and talk, I'll just talk, right? So what's the story of Exodus? Okay, I'll do it for you. So, <laughs> The story of Exodus is the basic story. Uh, uh, this is the second book in the Bible, right? And these are enslaved Israelites, 400 years enslaved in Pharaonic Egypt, right? And then what happens? God speaks to Moses and, and says, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go, right? And initially, Pharaoh doesn't listen. And there's this back and forth, to and fro. And eventually, Moses, who had some doubts about whether he was the man for the job, then takes the reins finally and leads the Israelites who were squabbling the whole way <laughs> out of Pharaonic Egypt, right? And we got the whole thing about the Red Sea and eventually they get to Canaan, the Promised Land, right? right? And Moses is the person who basically leads them to the cusp of that, right? So African Americans are looking at themselves with those spirituals, and this is articulated by these singers, these Virginia Jubilee singers. They are articulating a narrative explaining American slavery. They're saying that our 244 years of enslavement, this leader, Orpheus McAdoo of the singers, of the Jubilee singers, he's saying 244 years of slavery were not in vain. In fact, our 244 years of slavery is not indicative of our inferior, peripheral, marginal status. They completely reworked the, the reasoning for slavery by arguing that slavery was divinely ordained, that they are the modern day Israelites, that just like the Israelites from the Bible were taken out into a foreign land and enslaved for hundreds of years, these African Americans were taken out of their African homeland to be enslaved for hundreds of years in a foreign land. And they had been delivered 
in the context of the Civil War. And part of the divine mandate then was to take the hard lessons of slavery, take those lessons learned, and go back to their homeland to help regenerate the African continent. This is how the Virginia Jubilee Singers and Orpheus McAdoo, before he be, they begin their singing, they start with this optimistic, progressive narrative of African American history, explaining slavery in this fashion. And by explaining slavery in this fashion, remaking themselves not simply as units of labor, chattel slaves, but as people who have a central divine mission in history to go through enslavement and then help redeem or regenerate the African continent. And so they're singing these songs, but before they sing those songs that represent those ideas, McAdoo gives a history lesson, incorporating what I've just said to you, but also saying too, emphasizing the fact that African Americans have uh, had political leaders who were elected to Congress and were governors, and speaks to institutional building like Tuskegee University and Hampton Institute. And so, despite the hardships of American Jim Crow, the Virginia Jubilee Singers are emphasizing this progressive dynamic, this hopeful element of African American history. And so, Africans who are listening to these songs, and they play over a thousand shows over a five year period in South Africa, so they're there for a long time. And Africans are marveling at the technical ability of their singings, but they're particularly interested in that version of African American history. And I'll give you just a few quotes here. Um, an African newspaper called Invo Zabansundu uh, speaks this language, it writes in 1891, as Africans we are, of course, proud of the achievements of our race. It's significant that they say our race. These are African people speaking about African Americans who view themselves as part of the same race. Not people from a different continent, just completely distinct peoples, but peoples who share a type of history, who identify. And going further now, a postal worker, an African postal worker, again, taking the idea, the progressive idea of African American history by the Jubilee Singers speaks about their attainments. Right? There's no language here about lynching or disenfranchisement, but it's celebrating uh, the positives. Right. And now note, do you see something else in this? When will they stop? He's speaking about Africans now. So if you were to interpret this, there's a comparative dynamic happening here. Right? So sometimes when we do comparative history as scholars, we often forget that our historical subjects are also engaged in a comparative exercise. They're comparing themselves to each other. And, and so in this case now, here's this African man, Jos Josiah Samus, comparing Africans as a group to African Americans. And who comes out sort of ahead in that comparative exercise here? African Americans are projected as somehow more advanced. Look what they have done. And then there's sort of a lamentation for Africans. When will the day come when the African people will be like the Americans, right? So in the here we have the beginning of this sort of adulation this comparative exercise saying that African Americans are going to be senior partners in this transnational relationship. When will the day come when the African people will be like the Americans? When will they stop being slaves? Slaves? African peoples were not slaves in South Africa, but they're taking the language, they're taking the history of African Americans and identifying themse that, that, that themselves with that idea of slavery and they're suggesting that their forms of racial subordination are a type of slavery, right? And so now we have the merging of histories now with this transnational identification. There's another idea that sort of links these two populations, and that is what I call providential design, providential design. So I gave you some hints of that earlier, this idea of explaining slavery as, as a positive dynamic, and we see, again, we have to go uh, think about the Bible. And when we think about Africans watching these shows, it, observing the Virginia Jubilee Singers and other African Americans who were in South Africa in the 1890s, many are African Christians. And they call themselves Ethiopians. They're breaking away from white-led churches to establish their own churches and their own schools. And it's a religious form of independence. 
right? They're asserting their independence religiously to control their own religious institutions. And they call themselves Ethiopians. And why would they call themselves Ethiopians? Churches? Coptic churches? Yeah? Okay. More? Right, so we, we have a couple of things here. So yes, Ethiopia in the 1890s is one of two independent, we're moving toward full co colonialism, but Ethiopia will be one of the two independent African countries, right? The other one being Liberia. There's also uh, the, the historical dimension of Ethiopia being a long-standing Christian nation, right? And of course, we see Ethiopia mentioned many times in the Bible both as a country and also as a type of synonym for black peoples, right? And so here we have folk who are inspired by the historic con Christian country of Ethiopia, inspired by the recent political example of Ethiopia fighting off the Italian invasion to be an independent African country, one of the two, only, only two, and then this idea of Africa, uh, Ethiopia being mentioned in the Bible. Right, so these folk are referring themselves as Ethiopians in this way. And they're using particularly Psalm 6831. All right, so we're testing your biblical knowledge here. What does Psalm 6831 say? Yes, yes, close enough. Who wants to help? <laughs> this is a participatory exercise. <laughs> Princes shall come out of Egypt. And Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God here. So here we have African countries represented in the Bible. Again, placing black peoples as people of God. At the, and, and as part of the best-selling book of all time. Right? And again, this idea of African Americans being modern-day Israelites. Here's another um, African Christian as part of the African Methodist Episcopal Church an African-American Christian denomination that had established itself in South Africa in 1896. Here are African Christians, these Ethiopians, joining an African-American religious institution. So we have an actual institution. It's beyond the Virginia Jubilee Singers. An actual institution is being created on this continent. And here they're saying African-Americans were, quote, born of God as Moses and Egypt. Brothers, consider that carefully. We see that as an enduring theme, this idea providential design and African Americans being at a historical center, at the center of an unfolding, divinely ordained historical drama. Right? And we go on, specifying particularly African Americans, John Dubé, the first president of the African National Congress, which will be the leading anti-apartheid organization in the 20th century, gives us this. God has wonderfully prepared the Afro-Americans through years of bondage by a civilized nation even as were the Jews, for the task of civilizing their African brethren, a necessary first step to regain their independence. So here again, we have this sort of adulation of African Americans, this providential design that helps link, but also has potential problems in it. And do you see those potential problems? This setting African Americans up on a pedestal, right? So we have an uneven transnational relationship. So even as we have a dynamic that helps unify in some ways, on another level, that same dynamic is creating a type of cultural distance. While they're arguing for a racial affinity, there's a cultural distance here that's going to be problematic as this relationship goes on. Right? And so what we have here with the Jubilee Singers traveling around, eventually they sponsor African students who are interested in this education that they got at Hampton University to say, can we have some of that? There are no institutions of higher education for uh, black South Africans uh, before 1916. So McAdoo uses some of the proceeds of the monies from the Virginia Jubilee Singers to help sponsor students to go across to be educated at Hampton University and other historically black colleges and universities like Tuskegee, like my alma mater, Ham Howard University. And they're not the only one. Between 1895 and 1925, an estimated 400 African students migrate across the water to be educated in African colleges. Here's one, a woman named Charlotte Manye, uh, who journeyed over, started as part of an African choir, very much similar to the Virginia Jubilee Singers, who go across the water to tour in America. And they want to raise enough money 
to be able to, be, uh, to have a college education. She has a long, complicated story. The long and the short of it is that she ends up at Wilberforce University, the college of the American, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Right? So she inaugurates uh, this pipeline of about 400 Africans in uh, America between 1895 and 1925. And here are some more examples here. Here are two African students at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania playing football. And these folk are particularly inspired, these African Africans, as they this relationship develops, they're particularly inspired by the head of Tuskegee University, Booker T. Washington. Booker Washington was a classmate of many of those Virginia Jubilee singers in the 1870s. And we know the story of Booker Washington, right? You guys are Colgate students. You know Booker Washington, right? OK, good. We can move forward, right? <laughs> and what Booker Washington and Tuskegee represent for Africans is this idea of black autonomy, black institutional independence and autonomy, black self-determination. Booker Washington, of course, was born into slavery. And so he has this sort of up from slavery narrative. Indeed, one of his autobiographies is up from slavery, right? Well, a decade before his autobiography comes out in 1901, we talked about Virginia, the Ju Virginia Ju Jubilee singers and the McAdoo singers having this idea of an up from slavery narrative. So we have here Tuskegee academic education. Look at these neatly dressed students. Look how, look how well dressed they are. Right? right? So the form of academic education also, also was known as industrial education, what Washington called working with, his, with the hands, right? An education of the head and the heart and the hands, all three together. So we have these students migrating, right? These 400 or so students migrating across the water uh, between 1895 and 1925. And one of them is a fellow named Pixley Semi. Pixley Semi is um, at Columbia University. He actually graduates as a valedictorian in 1906. His honors thesis is called The Regeneration of Africa. Right? So he's understanding that the continent is, is colonized, but he's projecting an eventual um, African independence. And he is what one could consider to be a type of talented tenth, again, a Du Boisian notion of a talented tenth. These Africans regard themselves as a vanguard, as an elite. They're well-educated, um, and they are uh, deeply Christian. And Pixley Semi is the guiding spirit to the founding of the African National Congress, founded in 1912, particularly in protest of uh, and continued racial discrimination against Africans and the fact that Africans in the new Union of South Africa formed in 1910 are essentially not allowed to vote, are not political citizens, but regarded as subjects of the new Union. So the ANC is founded uh, primarily in reaction to uh, that broad disenfranchisement and other forms of discriminatory legislation. Throughout the 19-teens, these ANC members petition Great Britain, uh, the Union of South Africa is within, Great Brit within the British Commonwealth, and they get no redress. That's a long, complicated story, but I'm shortening it for us, because by 1920, they're rather disillusioned of any help coming from Great Britain or from other folk on the outside, but they still have this idea of African Americans being a type of liberatory force. Now, this is where our friend Marcus Garvey comes into the story. Marcus Garvey was not an African American. He was a Jamaican. He was born in 1887 in Jamaica. And he was a colonial subject. That's important to mention. Because that will also allow him to sort of have a type of affinity with the larger black world. And he moves around. He spends his early days, obviously, in, in Jamaica. And he's largely a self-educated uh, person. He reads voraciously, uh, reads everything he can. Uh, and he, as a young adult, he begins to move out into the world. And he travels throughout the Caribbean, into Central America, um, to London. And everywhere he sees, everywhere he sees, he finds that black people seem to be at the bottom of the societal ladder. And in 1914, sailing back from uh, England on his way back to Jamaica, he's on a ship. And there's a West Indian missionary with a South African wife. And, that, and he get, begins to talk to this, and then he gets the idea of what's going on in South Africa. And as he listens to uh, this West Indian missionary and, and his South African wife, he begins to think, where are the black man's governments, leaders? 
and, and I say black man because he's speaking in highly patriarchal kind of ways, right? And he says, I'm going to help found an organization that's going to lead to the regeneration of, of an independent Africa. That's his idea. And he co-founds with his future wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, otherwise known as the UNIA. The UNIA is a movement that we've heard about. All of us? Yes, most of us? Can I get a poll? How many have heard of the UNIA? Okay, and we know that it was bigger than the Civil Rights Movement, right? Yeah, yeah. this was a global movement. The UNIA began in 1914. At its peak, its epicenter was the United States. About 80% of its chapters were in the United States, but it was also in the Caribbean, it was in uh, uh, Latin America, Central America, it was in Africa. And it had as its broad ideas African independence from European colonialism, Africa for the Africans. That was the great slogan of that time. And a broad black political advancement, the idea of black peoples being in control of economic institutions. Uh, he had a shipping line. He had uh, this idea of black control of religious and educational institutions, pretty much like the Ethiopians in South Africa. Right? So the idea of black independence, black autonomy. And ultimately, what he wants to create is a transnational empire. Right? Fascinating idea of, of black people trying to establish something beyond a nation state. But that's something that's broader, uh, be, that's far beyond the nation state. He wants to create an empire. Right? So the UNIA has over 1,200 chapters at its peak all around the world in 43 countries. It has, at its peak, 300,000 dues-paying members and many more followers, almost 2 million followers. So this is, this is truly a, a global movement. And sometimes we overuse that term global, right? But in this case, you could argue that this is pushing out to the boundaries of the global. And these 2 million followers are connected through Garvey's newspaper, the UNI newspaper, The Negro World, which is published in English, French and Spanish. They are animated by the idea of the Black Star Line that's going to be this independent shipping line that's going to be an example of black-led commerce, but also is going to be the carrier to take those in the diaspora back to West Africa for those who choose. And the place, the beachhead, for this return of African Americans to Africa is Liberia. And obviously, Liberia, like Ethiopia, that's the only two independent countries, right? And Liberia is West Africa, where most African diasporic peoples come from. And so this is an idea of returning home. So the idea, the Garvey idea of back to Africa is being um, imagined through the Black Star Line. That's going to be this commercial enterprise, but also the tangible vehicle to take diasporic black peoples back to Africa to help fulfill the prophecy of Africa for Africans. Right? And so the movement is primarily based in America, then the Caribbean, and then Africa. And within Africa, South Africa has the most UNIA chapters and has the greatest impact. I've been able to count at least 24, I'm up to 24 chapters of the UNIA in South Africa. And it's spreading, this idea of spreading of Garveyism, Africa for Africans, it's being transformed into institutional development primarily by West Indian uh, maritime workers. These are dock workers in port cities like Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, and to a lesser extent, Durban. Right? And these are West Indians who have been sailing all over the world. They were maritime sailors. And they saw, like Garvey, how black peoples were disadvantaged throughout the world and saw connections. And these are the people who translated Garveyism as an ideology into UNIA chapters. People well positioned on the ports, using their maritime skills as sailors to settle eventually in these port cities, to work on the docks. And who's getting the first news about what's happening in, from the larger world? These sailors transmitting to these dock workers. And so those dock workers are well positioned to um, translate Garveyism into UNIA chapters. So they're mostly West Indians, and then there are some what are called mixed race peoples, uh, uh, known as colors. 
Most of these folk, these Garveyites, and this is where we get into distinctions of what Garveyism looks like throughout South Africa, most of these West Indians and coloreds are of what we would call high, slightly higher class. It's hard to imagine um, middle class if there's not really an upper class when we talk about black people at this time, right? But they're at a higher, slightly higher uh, class level, and they're mostly articulating their Garveyism through labor organizing, through trade union, unionism, through strikes and through this great hope of the Black Star Line coming, being this representative of economic independence. Ultimately, too, they want, some of them want a gradualist incorporation to an existing society, but many others are hopeful that the UNIA will be a vehicle to take a case internationally to the League of Nations, to have uh, mandate territories from the former German colonial state, to Southwest Africa and others, to have those after Germany lost in World War I and those former German colonies were going to be held by the League of Nations, Garvey and the UNIA petitioned to have those from former German colonies turned over to the UNIA. Right? So these Cape Town Garveyites were interested in this idea of having those former German colonies turned over to the UNIA, and that would help lead this idea of Africa for the Africans and make that real. Here's an actual UNIA certificate. Uh, this is a fellow named Robertson Gonsalves from Antigua who arrived in South Africa in Cape Town in the early uh, 20th century and was one of the leading members of the Cape Town chapters, UNIA chapters. Of the 24 UNIA chapters, there were nine in Cape Town. And so you get a sense of what the idea was if, to be a member of the UNIA uh, once you paid your dues you got this certificate. Right. Anything jump out at you when you read that? More biblical language. Yeah, yeah, where do you see it? And this talk of an Ethiopian nation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. A, a language of freedom and manhood, manhood and nationalism, right? So, so quite often these nationalist movements, and we, we see them as beyond black people, but these nationalist movements have this masculinist language to it, right? So one of the precursors for a nationalism is the recovery of a type of, of manhood, right? Because the language of, of, of being colonized, quite often that idea was that we, black men particularly have been emasculated in some ways, that the colonial condition is emasculating. So to overturn that colonial condition, quite often the prerequisite is posited that there has to be a recovery of black uh, manhood. Right? And again, this is beyond black people. We find this idea of manliness and naturalism shot through constantly. Right? So we have that kind of language here, this muscular male uh, nationalism articulated here. Again, some of the fault lines and these liberationist movements right, that we have to pay attention to. Right? So in the age of Garvey, we have a continuance of this idea of a providential design. Right? Again, we're looking beyond just narrow politics to consider how religion is used as a unifying ideal. And Garvey picks up on this. This is one of the, the, genius, the, the genius aspects of Garvey, is that he's able to understand the political winds, the religious language, understanding that many black peoples are deeply religious, and that you can move people, you can speak to their hearts with religious metaphors and concepts. Right? So it's beyond just speaking to the head right, in straightforward pol political ways, but it's also speaking to black peoples in ways that they might respond to on a deeper level. And Garvey does very well by working with pastors, right, who have large congregations and are able to speak this biblical language very well and connect it to the politics of the day. So Garvey is very savvy about this. And the UNIA actually takes on a sort of quasi-religious context. UNIA meetings are on Sunday. Branches had a chaplain. They would start with prayers. They, was, they would have uh, 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 spirituals as part of the singing. Right? So there's this heavy religious aspect 
and this evocation of Garvey himself as a type of Moses. And so here we have language of the Cape Town Garveyites. These are West Indians, both of them, William Jackson and Timothy Robertson. Right, so you get the kind of idea of the providential design and Garvey specifically being posited as the Moses, right, as the person who is going to deliver. So Garvey and the UNIA, that's the vehicle to realize this idea of providential design. And there are South Africans beyond these West Indians. Here's another person, James Taele, who spent 12 years being educated at Lincoln University. So he's part of that educational pipeline. And he becomes a fervent uh, Garveyite in the 1920s. He's also an example of Garveyism existing outside the UNIA. James Taele becomes the leader of the African National Congress. He becomes the leader of the, of the Cape Town branch of the African National Congress. And he articulates his Garveyism through forms of civil disobedience. But it's not race specific. James Taile had a colored mother, a mixed race mother, and an African father. And James Taile is an example of, of early Africans organizing with other groups, in this case Indians, but also organizing outside the UNIA as a leader of the ANC. He was a fiery speaker. This is a picture of him um, in Cape Town. Uh, delivering a, a rally to men on their lunch hour, right? Now, this idea of the providential design then fulfill, gets to a sort of culmination with this fella, Dr. Wellington. Now, this is an example of Garveyism in rural areas, rather different than Garveyism in Cape Town, as I mentioned, so, sort of middle class, organized around trade unionism, oftentimes gradualist politics. Dr. Wellington comes to the fore in the mid-1920s, and he's in rural areas, and he has a prophecy. He, he suggests that on March 12, 1927, American Negroes will come in planes. They will throw down flaming balls of charcoal on all those who are not members of the UNIA, all those who support white supremacy in South Africa. And he says, you better sign up and get your membership ticket now because that's the only way that you're going to be immune from the coming apocalypse. And he's using biblical language now. So we move from the Old Testament with Exodus to the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And he's speaking about the last days. And when there's drought, he's saying this is an example of the last days, of the coming of the apocalypse. And the American Negroes are coming in their airplanes. Wellington says, I know about what I speak because I am an African American. He says that he's an American Negro doctor from Chicago, a World War I veteran who had helped America uh, win the war in World War I, helping Great Britain win that war. And he has this fascinating tale saying, I'm a veteran, I'm a medical doctor from Chicago, and I know on good authority that King George promised America, South Africa as their own territory in exchange for their help during World War I. But South African leaders had reneged on that deal. And so Wellington, representing Garvey, claiming that America is a black-led nation, imagine this, America is the most powerful nation in the world after World War I, and it's a black nation? This is fascinating to rural black South Africans who have heard garbled versions of this idea of the American Negro, who have had some understanding of this idea of providential design. And here is this American Negro, this doctor from Chicago, suggesting this apocalyptic prophecy. Can you imagine <laughs> how exciting this must be for Africans who are suffering from great landlessness, who are overtaxed, who are considered to be ethnic-based subjects and not citizens of their country, what this could mean. And when state officials don't act against Wellington, they try to arrest him, he gets lawyers, he finds ways out, he finds legal loopholes. He's constantly escaping the grasp of the state. And so Africans are joining Wellington's UNIA in, in great numbers. Institutionally, 
Garveyism shows up in the forms of churches and schools in Wellington's UNIA. Again, they're building on the old Ethiopian model of black independent institutions, religiously and educationally. They want to be able to control the education, religiously and otherwise, of their young people particularly. This is a deep-seated desire for Africans. And they also go further and they intimidate non-UNIA Africans. And so in these rural areas, you have these battlegrounds being played out where you, Wellington UNIA members who call themselves Americans actually take on that transnational identity as opposed to being called ethnic-based native subjects. They actually burn down houses of anyone supporting the government. They intimidate those people. They carry flags, American flags, saying that we are the Americans. They are singing these spirituals as well. And it goes on and on and on. And the state officials decide, what do we do about this guy, Wellington? What would you do <laughs> if you were a magistrate? And you're like, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that, right? Yeah. So local magistrates say, OK, well, the way to get at this guy is not to fight the idea of Garveyism or the idea that black people are oppressed, because they're really mobilized on that issue, right? The way to fight this guy is to try to prove that he's not an African American. And in one of the many court cases that Wellington has, they bring his father into court. And the father testifies, yes, that is my son. His name is not Dr. Wellington. As far as I know, he has no medical degree. Um, as far as I know, and I think I was there at the birth, his name is Wellington Butulezi. He's a Zulu man from rural South Africa. And I don't know all this talk about being an African-American. I know nothing about that. And so the prosecutor thinks, aha, we got you. And they turn to Wellington. What do you have to say about that? And Wellington, in a great show of hubris, says, I've never seen that man in my life. <laughs> Young people, whatever you do in your life, Never deny your own parents. <laughs> you know? It's not a good idea. But this is how far Wellington went to keep up the subterfuge that he was an African American. Why did he take on that identity? Because of the power of the mythology of the African American liberator, the American Negro. In some ways, this idea that developed in the 1890s is culminating with Wellington. It's going beyond people identifying with American institutions and, Amer and African American peoples. It goes beyond people like James Taile, who spent 12 years in, a, in American educational institutions and came back with an American accent and had people listen to him more closely because he had this American connection. Now it goes to a South African actually pretending to be an African American because there is great political legitimacy and cachet in that identity. And Wellington knows that and uses it to good effect. So he builds institutionally this version of Garvey, Garveyism that Garvey, by the way, eventually finds out about and says, not in my name. And in the pages of the Negro world, Garvey denounces Wellington and says he is not a legitimate representative of the UNIA. This is one example of Garveyism taking on different forms of Africans in, in another way, in a way, indigenizing Garveyism, this transnational ideology. So the active agent is not the ideology. The active agents are Africans who are looking at this ideology and saying, what can I use? How can I use this ideology for my localized context? So Garveyism looks very differently throughout South Africa and indeed around the black world. Yes? Yeah, so he always spoke in English. Of course he knew Zulu and several other African languages, but he pretended not to know those languages. And so he always spoke in English. And English was a, a sense, a type of status marker. The fact that you spoke English suggested that you were more cosmopolitan, right? That you didn't speak local South African languages, but you spoke a global language, right? And so Wellington always spoke in English, and he would go through this whole song and dance of having his assistants translate you know, commentary from his audience members, right? And so there's this whole subterfuge of Wellington taking on this identity. Uh, and so uh, this is what we have here. So now, eventually, what undoes Wellington is the fact that 
the Americans never come. And so we had this long buildup now, right, of Wellington having these prophecies built on the hope of African Americans coming to liberate, and the African Americans don't come. They don't come through the UNIA because Garvey's UNIA in America was on the decline. Garvey himself had many difficulties in the United States, served a jail term, and then when he got out, he was deported from the United States, and it struggled to regain the formal momentum of his movement. And so there's a story of the decline of the American UNIA at the very time that it's developing in South Africa. So again, Garveyism is taking on a life of its own in many ways, right? So this idea of African Americans being liberators begins to break down with the failure of Wellington's prophecies by 1930. But it doesn't mean that's the end of the transnational relationship. What develops here is the continuance of an educational pipeline. And here's a woman, Sibu Sisiwe Makanya. Say that three times, Sibu Sisiwe Makanya. Don't want to try it? OK, we'll move on. <laughs> who represents uh, the continued pipeline of people going to liberal arts institutions, like the type of school that Colgate, although they didn't come to Colgate, but liberal arts institutions like Colgate. And this relationship continues, this transnational relationship continues. It continues on a personal level through Mady Hall Kluma, an African-American woman from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who comes in 1938 to marry Alfred Kluma, and that's how you say the X. Anybody want to try a click? That's how you have to do it. OK, yeah, OK, we've got some brave souls there. OK, good. So Alfred Kluma is another example of an African in this educational pipeline. Alfred Kluma is a black South African who goes in the 1920s to be educated in America. He goes to Tuskegee and eventually gets a medical degree from the University of Minnesota, goes for further medical training in England, and comes back as, as a doctor in the late 1930s. His first wife dies, and he had met Mady Hall at a conference in, in the United States in 1936, and proposes marriage to her long distance. Right? Now, they had only met once. And imagine getting a letter if you're Mady Hall, like, I only, I only met you once, <laughs> but I really liked you, <laughs> and I think we should get married. Now, would you, can you imagine going 8,000 miles away now to, to, to marry a person that you just met once? Like, leave your life. Now, she had a settled life. She was a very educated woman. She was doing good work in North Carolina. But they have a correspondence, and eventually she decides to take the leap. And one of the reasons she decides to take the leap, because she also has this idea, like McAdoo earlier, that African Americans, like her, had a special providential duty to help regenerate the African continent. And she saw her marriage to Alfred Kluma as a personal manifestation of this relationship between African Americans and Africans. And she too has this idea of providential design, but she also um, tries to raise money for African political activities by staging a play called the American Negro Review. And again, she has this up from slavery narrative, this whole play which raises a considerable amount of money for the African National Congress, virtually bankrupt at that time, is this whole from slavery to freedom narrative of black peoples going through 244 years of enslavement and culminates with African American cultural heroes like Paul Robeson and sporting heroes like Joe Lewis. And so she titles this American Negro Review, The Progress of a People. And what is that for? That is to raise money for the African National Congress, which her husband, is now the president of. The African National Congress in the late 1930s, when Alfred Kluma takes over as president, was virtually bankrupt and defunct. And these two people together now help reorganize and regenerate the African National Congress. Mady Hall Kluma is the first president of the ANC Women's League, bringing women into the ANC. And the two together now are bringing together this ANC, this transatlantic traffic now, is showing up in the regeneration of the ANC, and further, linking up again with global struggles. Our friend Du Bois is here. Right next to Du Bois, to Du Bois's left, is Alfred Kluma. 
To the right of Du Bois is a man named Max Jurgen. Max Jurgen had been an African American missionary in South Africa in the 1920s and 30s. Max Jurgen helped found an organization, the first anti apartheid organization, called the Council on African Affairs. Within the Council on African Affairs was Jurgen, W.B. Du Bois, and the great Paul Robeson. This picture is from 1946. It's in San Francisco at the founding of the UN, the United Nations. The person who wrote the preamble to the United Nations Charter, the preamble that talked about human rights, was Jan Smuts, the president, the premier, the prime minister specifically of South Africa. Now hear me on this now. The person writing the preamble to the United Nations, speaking the language of human rights, of equality, <laughs> of respect for human beings is the head of South Africa that has sanctioned racial discrimination. And Jan Smuts wants to incorporate Southwest Africa, which South Africa is legally holding, they want to incorporate that into South Africa. In other words, Jan Smuts is going to the United Nations to get sanctioned to spread forms of racial segregation beyond the borders of South Africa. And Alfred Kluma and W.B. Du Bois and, and Max Jurgen, as part of the Council on African American Affairs, are there at the United Nations. And Jan Smuts is there at the United Nations at a, at a dinner program, and he sees Alfred Kluma there. And he turns and says, well, what are you doing here, 10,000 miles away from South Africa? And Alfred Kluma says, I've come to meet my prime minister. My prime minister won't meet with me in South Africa, so I've had to go 10,000 miles across the water and link up with African Americans to stop Jan Smuts, my prime minister, from spreading racial segregation in Southern Africa. And this coalition now are able to stop Jan Smuts at that meeting from incorporating Southwest Africa into South Africa. And this is the beginning of a global anti-apartheid alliance of African Americans and black South Africans. But what do we make of Garvey, who dies in 1940, and his movement of Garveyism? The UNIA as an organization struggles in the 1930s into the 40s. There are still some UNIA chapters, even in South Africa today. But the real power is Garveyism as an ideology that continued on, particularly the idea of Africa for the Africans. And even as Garvey died in 1940, we can see that his legacy lived on through Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, who was also educated at Lincoln University, right? spent 12 years in America, and led the anti-colonial struggle in what became Ghana. And Kwame Nkrumah talked about being deeply influenced by Garvey's ideas, the idea of an Africa for the Africans. Kwame Nkrumah names his navy the Black Star Line after Garvey's shipping line. And he speaks profoundly at the Day of Independence in 1957 about the effect of Garvey's on, on his psychology, the power, the political and ideological power of Garveyism to help mobilize anti-colonial struggles. And he quotes Garvey. And he says that Garvey's vision has come true. Africa for the Africans has fulfilled itself. The, ideology of Garveyism then is powerful throughout the African continent. Here, Kwame Nkrumah with that other guy. Who is that guy next to him? <laughs> Martin Luther King. Oh yeah, that guy, Martin Luther King, who came to Ghana's independence ceremonies. By the way, that's one of Martin King's best speeches, Birth of a New Nation. It's far better than the speech that he gave at the March on Washington, but that's just my own personal feeling. Right. So as we move forward then, and we consider that Kwame Nkrumah was the head of Ghana and our friend, W.B. Du Bois, went into exile, ultimately, in Ghana. And our friend W.B. Du Bois, on the eve of the March on Washington, died in Ghana at the age of, 19, 19, uh, at the age of 95. It would be nice if he lived until 1995. <laughs> But going forward with that, this idea of Africa for the Africans then, and this idea of a providential design, the ideals of Garveyism lived on and still live on. The idea of Africa for the Africans did not become fully realized in a political sense until 1994. 
when this global anti-apartheid movement linking black South Africans with people of goodwill all over the world, including African Americans in the United States, helped bring down the apartheid regime. And I remember vividly in 1990, when Nelson Mandela came out of jail and did a world tour and came to New York, it is like the transnational relationship had reversed because many African Americans looked at this black South African, Nelson Mandela, as a type of Moses figure who was not just going to liberate black South Africans, not just complete the Africa for Africans prophecy of Garvey, but would also help African Americans deal with continued post-civil rights racial disabilities. And so the Moses dynamic, this transnational relationship that had become more even after the Garvey movement had declined somewhat, now shifted to African Americans looking toward this black South African, Nelson Mandela, as a type of Moses. So this transnational relationship continued. And as we come to the close then, what are we talking about in this story? What's the point of the story? What we're emphasizing in this story here is this two-way traffic not just one way that we find in much transnational history, a two-way traffic of people and ideologies and institutions trying to eliminate the Du Boisian notion of a global color line, right? that firm understanding. Scholars are catching up to these historical subjects who framed these struggles and these larger uh, contexts. It's really also a history of the political and religious imagination in the Atlantic world, the power of the ideas of providential design, uh, up from slavery narrative, the idea of Africa for the Africans as a way to animate and unify disparate peoples. It's a way to talk about Africans being active agents and not just passive subjects accepting an ideology who are indigenizing Garveyism and the broader ideas by and about Americans, including African Americans and black West Indians. It's a way for us at this wonderful moment in Garvey stu studies with a number of uh, fascinating uh, scholars uh, who are writing books about Garveyism are spreading the idea that Garvey studies beyond looking at just Garvey and being centered on New York, the UNIA headquarters. So we now have work looking at this global movement, Garveyism, throughout the US South, the Midwest, into the Caribbean, into Africa. We're really coming to terms again with the global nature of the Garvey movement. This is just one small example of that exciting work being done by many scholars. And now we are also able to look at South African history, which is notoriously parochial and narrow, looking navel gazing within its own borders, looking at South African history out in the world, and indeed African history out in the world. And we can also consider American history in a broader transnational context. And in this exciting field of African diaspora studies, the interesting dynamic there is that Africa and Africans are often left out of that exciting scholarship. And here we have an example again of Africa and Africans being at the center of this diasporic scholarship. So this story sits at the intersection of all of these dynamics. The work will go on. And I thank you very much for listening. <laughs> just wait just a minute for some folk to clear out. But for those who are, are, are want to stay and continue the conversation, let's do it. That's one of the great ironies yes. of Garvey. So the question was that you know, Garvey obviously had a deep influence on, on Africans, but he himself uh, never made it to, to Africa, uh, unlike his, one of his rivals, W.B. Du Bois, who did, right? 
Uh, part of the reason was the, the, the great fear of Garveyism. So these colonial governments in Africa and the Caribbean often banned him from entering, right? Uh, so uh, but that's one of the great ironies. Uh, the person who articulates this idea of Africa for Africans himself never set foot on the African continent. Yeah. Yeah. So it was up to his spirit, his, the ideology, to, be, to go forward with that. Yes, sir. Right, so Garveyism obviously uh, has a great impact on people who are more secular. Um, so there are various entry points for Garvey, uh, particularly in West Africa and in parts of the Caribbean, folk were less interested in the religious dynamic and far more interested in the economic part. So they were very interested in the Black Star Line. In West Africa, the concern for, the, for those folk, these were farmers, most of the Garveyites were farmers and um, but commercial farmers, so they, they controlled goods. They were importing and exporting goods, mostly exporting goods, right? And they were dealing with a monopoly of the Elder Dempster uh, firm shipping line, where they had to sell their produce at a lesser price uh, because of that monopoly. So they, the Black Star Line was a vehicle around that monopoly for a type of economic independence. These folk in West Africa far less interested in Garvey's Back to Africa platform or the idea that somehow diasporic blacks were going to come out, you know, save Africa. These were folk who were deeply offended by Garvey's self-proclaimed title of provisional president of Africa, right? And so this was perhaps a weakness of the Garvey movement, but also I think a type of strength that people could come into the movement in different ways. So there's a dynamism there, right? Now, connecting it to uh, what we find with Garveyism as an ideology, what you have to do, obviously, is follow the people. You don't follow the UNIA chapters. You follow people who may have been part of the UNIA at some point. You follow where they go. And quite often what we see is a number of, of black nationalist movements um, influenced by Garvey, but that don't have the Judeo-Christian dynamic to, to them, uh, may have uh, an Islamic bent to it, for instance, right? And so we, we trace this ideology amongst various people and we see those ideals continuing. So it wasn't necessarily relying on the Judeo-Christian dynamic, but it was an animating force for many. Yeah, it's a great, great question because Garveyism as an ideology was so diffuse, right? And so there we go. Yeah, sure. Yes, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I have you. Right, so, yes, for, so folk are being left out. We're talking about who's, who's in, but who are being left out. So non-Christians, <laughs> right? Uh, quite often women are, are being left out when, when the Moses is gendered male, right? And I think uh, we, we lose something of the everyday nature of political activity if we focus on charismatic leaders like Garvey. So much of Garvey's studies, for instance, is looking at the grassroots. Right, and understanding that. Um, one of the interesting dynamics of doing research in South Africa, finding many of the families who were engaged with Garveyism in the 20s, mostly but I was talking to the children of Garveyites, people who were very small, who remember um, vaguely uh, what their parents were up to. And, what we, when, and when you ask the basic questions beyond who spoke at me, right, you get uh, a sense of who was actually organizing. 
So who's actually going, knocking on doors, talking with people, saying, come to the meeting, making flyers, doing, doing the hard work of getting people to come out. People who are very busy, have all sorts of things to do. And what we found over and over again, it was their mothers who were doing it. It was the women who were doing the day-to-day -day organizing. But when, it should, when you look at the source record, and we find a lot of this in the Negro world itself, it's a, it's, a, it's a quick note about what was happening with these divisions, what they did. It's a whole catalog of men who, speak, who spoke, who said this, who said that, who talked in the language of providential design. And so um, quite often what's being left out then are the contributions of women on a day-to-day -day basis, right, who are the backbone of that movement. Uh, I think the other dynamic, too, that's being left out um, and, and so I, I alluded to this a bit, is that uh, when you set up this unequal transnational dynamic of, of Africans sort of being junior partners and African Americans being senior partners, the weakness of the Wellington movement was this desire of, of waiting for liberation from outside. And so you can institution build with your churches and schools, but ultimately the major change was going to happen with these American Negroes coming, right? And so that was sort of disempowering in some ways. And I think the great lesson of the Wellington movement was to say we can't wait for outside liberation, but that we need to take a, a, a stronger hold of our own liberatory possibilities. Does that get it, your question? Or am I not quite getting there? A bit. So I was thinking about the gymnasium. Mm. Yeah, I think I have it now, and I think that was a question. Yeah. I think uh, uh, you're hitting at it because there were contemporaries of Garvey who made these similar points. Um, so communist or socialist influenced activists um, uh, criticized Garvey in the United States and elsewhere, saying that um, he was setting people up for failure in some ways, that these prophecies uh, could not come true that his organizational capacity was uh, weak underneath all the, all the language of Africa for Africans and the Black Star Line and this and that and the other, that it wasn't a sustainable movement. And it was setting people up for failure. And this idea of religious-based, uh, for, for, for socialist and communist-inspired folk, this was pie in the sky. Religion is the opiate of the masses kind of dynamic. So they shied away from this idea of religion uh, being part of any type of solution. Right? And also, uh, Du Bois also criticized uh, some of the religious aspect. He praised Garvey for working with churches, for using religious idioms as a way to build a movement. But then he also criticized Garvey's uh, financial mismanagement, saying that this is a house of cards. Right? That, and that, in, in other words, um, these prophecies would not come true, not because the religious dynamic is off, but because of your financial mismanagement. But still, he, 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 you know, he, he began his critique of Garvey through the religious dimension. But it was mostly communist slash socialist critics of Garvey who was very suspicious of religion anyway and said that religion was a, was a means to control as much as liberate, right? It was a way to inhibit or to close down liberation possibilities. So there, there was that critique. All right, that was my second stab at it. Did I get closer? Okay, all right. Yes, sir. I just want to follow up mm -hmm. on that question in terms mm -hmm. of um, you know, first taking the Exodus narrative and turning the, mm -hmm. the, uh, narrative, the Christian narrative, which could be so mm -hmm. you know, enslaving, into a liberating one. Mm -hmm. And so there's first the point that religious narratives can be liberating as well as oppressive. Mm -hmm. But the question is a really interesting theological one. If you want mm -hmm. to use or employ religious narratives to be liberating, can the very theological notion of providence and divine agency being so, in fact, determinative, um, can, mm -hmm. is there enough room in there for human agency? 
Or do you need a different Christian narrative than one that is so driven by providence? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's debate mm-hmm. within Calvinism, even in South Africa, and Alan, Alan Bozak and others that have this debate about right. whether Calvinism, you know, which is so predestination laden, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. whether that can be liberated. So it's interesting that Darby uses this narrative. Um, did he use the term predestination per se? To he did not use that term, but he, he spoke in the language of an elect. The sort of Calvinist dynamic. He didn't use the term elect, but it's the same dynamic. So who's the elect? The conflict with Afrikaners saying they're their elect, right? Um, and that's a justification for their rule. But Garvey's suggesting that American Negroes are the type of elect, right? So there's this competition. And then there's also this theological battleground of what constitutes true Christianity. Like what patterns of behaviors, political activities are within the Christian paradigm um, of Jesus Christ. So there were a lot of theological conversations about the applicability of Christianity on the ground. I think another dynamic, a way to engage Christianity and get out of sort of the providential design sort of dynamic was a deep appreciation of the role that um, black peoples broadly, how black peoples use Judeo-Christian ideas and text to sustain themselves, right? So we, we underplay that sometimes, right? The importance of reworking a narrative uh, that to speak to you and your immediate circumstance, to get you through the day to day, right? That, so you can do that without the providential design or even actually coming up with an, a concept of the elect, right? Uh, because now that's been beyond the religion, that's, that's part of your cultural sustenance, which is vitally important when you're under psychological attack not just physical attack, but psychological attack, arguing that you are inferior, right? So to, to be part of this grand Judeo-Christian narrative and tradition, that in and of itself was particularly liberating for many, right? So in that way, then, there's a way to come into the Judeo-Christian narrative without some of these pitfalls, right? And I think that mattered um, for, for many Garveyites uh, deeply. And I think Garvey, part of his genius was understanding that. that you know, that's, part, that's the dynamic for blacks holding on to this Judeo-Christian religion. I know you have thoughts, because you know, th- these are my ideas based on the sources I'm reading. But you know, there are other ways to look at this, right? I mean, it's an active, ongoing conversation about what, you know, how religion and these ideas and concepts are being used, and to what extent are they liberatory, and what extent are they inhibiting. Right? And that's part of the exciting dynamic, because we look at these things, uh, the religious ideas as connectors, but again, as I alluded to, there are also problematics in it. And that's the exciting part of the history, is not simply to evoke, oh yes, there are connections, but like work through you know, the good and the bad, if you will, the difficult in that. Uh, yes? Mm-hmm. I, I guess I'm following up uh, on these two questions. So, yeah. I mean, talk about things like destinies, he also in Du Bois, Mm-hmm. I guess the, the way I sort of thought of their talk of destiny was something kind of in this like bleak classical, you know, there's certain things that are faded, but there's a lot of free will along the way to those routes. Do, do you mm-hmm. see the kind of the talk of those people like Andrew Sue Boys and Cromel Stock destiny is somehow different? I mean, I don't, at least Du Bois doesn't mm-hmm. seem to depend upon mm-hmm. that particular exodus. But I mean, right. it's kind of related to the idea of destiny. You see them doing something very different than Garvey work? No, in fact, I think Garvey was building uh, from this, these 19th century uh, black nationalists like Cromwell, like Martin Delaney, like all these folk, who make this argument of, of the special place of the diasporic black, right? This idea of a return and being part of this biblical narrative. I think Garvey was building on that. In some ways, the Garvey movement is a culmination of that dynamic of religious nas- religious-based nationalism that was really powerful in the 19th century and sort of carried into the 20th century. Again, part of Garvey's genius, taking existing ideas that were very fertile and trying to apply them to that particular moment. And I think, um, in some ways, the decline of the Garvey movement is, uh, corresponds to a, a, a decline in religious-based black nationalism. I think it becomes far more secular in the 1930s. Um, uh, particularly in the United States, but also in places like South Africa, Caribbean labor movements in the 1930s, right? So I think uh, that religious dimension sort of 
becomes de-emphasized, even as you keep the other elements of black nationalism. Uh, and of course, what, that's the context of the 1930s. We're dealing with a global depression, right? right? So this is where folk who are more secular socialist slash communists can make inroads now, uh, speaking to everyday concerns. Right? And so you're not dealing with waiting or these other religious ideas. I think that's, that's part of the dynamic. We can look at the Garvey movement in that way as a culmination of ideas really coming out of the 19th century. Right, right, and that, that's the fraught nature of, of that global color line. So again, it, it's, it can be a broad unifying concept, but there can be misunderstandings of the specificity of struggle. I think if we use Garvey as an example in bringing Du Bois, one of the fault lines in their relationship was uh, Du Bois's criticism of Garvey uh, for misreading African-American history. Uh, one example was a meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. Garvey met with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan basically arguing that, look, we both have ideas of racial separatism. And Garvey had a very pessimistic idea of the place of African Americans ultimately in America, arguing that eventually you will have to return to Africa. You know, the US is a white man's country. Give it up. Go back to your continent. Right? And so he meets with the Klan leader, um, Edwin, Edward Simmons. Um, and, and for Du Bois and others, uh, this begins a Garvey must go campaign of, of deporting Garvey, to actually working in some ways in tandem with uh, a very young J. Edgar Hoover, by the way, <laughs> uh, trying to railroad Garvey into jail, etc. But this was the fault line. Garvey, um, as much as he toured the United States, as much as he understood the global nature of white supremacy, this was a, a strategic miscalculation. Um, not fully understanding the depth of which African Americans held the KKK and deep hatred and loathing, and that there could be no circumstance whatsoever to meet with a leader of the KKK. There could be no justification for it, right? And, and so that is an example um, of uh, sort of décalage, uh, this, this term, this French term, the saying that's a slippage that's happening here um, that creates unfortunate divisions amongst people who are broadly trying to move in the same direction, right? And, and so that's an example. And so that's why, um, in some ways, it's fascinating to understand the differences as well as the unifying dynamics and to learn lessons from that, that what happens when you're not specific enough to understand folk on a local level and what might move them and what might deeply offend them. Uh, terrible miscalculation by Garvey. It cost him great momentum in his own movement. So that's, that's the work that has to be done. That's the work of diaspora, of not just articulating connections and celebrating them in some fashion, but really drilling down to say, OK, after we have the initial contact and sense of unity and understanding, what else can sustain this? What's sustainable in our relationship? And so a big part of that is, is the language of translation, culturally, sometimes linguistically. Uh, but being attuned to the need to translate, right? And to understand that we are united by a type of blackness, uh, but there are other things that may pull us apart and we may, must be attuned to that. So for instance, to come to the close in this way, it's very difficult to have a black transnational politics that's predicated on the existence of white supremacy. Because you're trying to get rid of white supremacy, but that can't be your unifying ideal Right? You need something else to engage. And where am I going with this? So for instance, if we look at uh, post-colonial Africa, it was very difficult for Pan-Africanists to, um, it was easier to understand South Africa, apartheid South Africa. It was much easier to understand Southern Rhodesia, where you had whites dominating blacks. You got a clear racial binary. It was much harder 
to make sense of the Nigerian Civil War, for instance, right? Where you don't have that easy white-black binary, right? And so your politics can be transnational. They can be animated by, um, by unity against white supremacy, but that can't be your sole plank. You have to have other forms of connection. And that's the ongoing struggle of pan-Africanism now, to reconstitute a way to find le levers of unity beyond narrow ideas of race. Okay. That's my take on it. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay.